Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, photo forensics. Uh, let me start off by giving credit where credit is due. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about is, um, well, in fairness, it's, it's actually credited to all the students and my collaborators in my lab. But the majority of the work that I'll talk about here is that of a terrific grad student in my lab who just graduated, Eric Key, and a collaborator of mine, Professor James O'Brien, at Berkeley, where I was on sabbatical last year. Um, so what we think about is when I give you a photo, um, has it been altered or manipulated in any way from its initial recording? And let me start off, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about some of the technology that we've developed that can analyze images. But let me just start off by sort of talking about why we care about this problem of photo forensics and where is the impact of photo manipulation happening in the world around us. So it's hard to pick up a magazine um, or a newspaper and look at an advertising where the models in that ad have not been photoshopped to oblivion and literally to oblivion. So for example, um, is there a laser pointer? I have a pencil, but it's not going to reach. <laughs> okay, while, while you look for that. Um, so, uh, shown in the top right is an ad that showed up in, uh, for Olay products. Uh, this is a magnified view that you see here of the model. This is the same person taken around the same time as that photo, and that's what she looks like in real life. This ad was banned in the UK for false advertising. Uh, the uh, uh, advertising um, agency that oversees truthless advertising said, you know what, this is not what this product does, and you can't say that it does that. And this, of course, was a heavily Photoshopped photo. This is one of my favorites, a Ralph Lauren ad. Um, somebody actually did a biomechanical analysis of that model and showed that the size of her here is actually smaller than a person's skeleton. Okay? So we've, we've really gone sort of off the deep end when it comes to Photoshopping. This is not about removing a few wrinkles here or there. This is about crafting physically impossible people. And there is a huge body of literature. Thank you very much. There's a huge body of literature um, that has linked um, exposure to these types of images to eating disorder, body dissatisfaction, depression. So there is, in fact, sort of a health and societal impact. Okay. So where else are we seeing the impact? Uh, these are four photographs taken um, um, during and after the impact of Sandy on the East Coast, mainly in lower Manhattan. It shows really um, dramatic. Is it possible? Sorry, I'm going to ask one more favor. Can we reduce the lights on the front here? Um, sorry. Just <laughs> I'm going to have another request. Too. <laughs> You're so demanding. Okay, both of you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly an improvement. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, four photographs uh, from Sandy showed really, I mean, unprecedented and really sort of hard to believe photographs. And if you recall, as that storm was hitting, um, it was sort of chaos, and we didn't know what was going on. Communications had broken down. We were getting these things largely from things like Facebook and online sources. Oh, that was good. Thank you. Um, and the problem, of course, is that although these four are real, um, they were joined with photographs like <laughs> this one. OK. Well, you don't need for me to tell you that this is a fake photograph. So fine, that's funny. I mean, that's actually yeah, really funny. Um, but these photos were also circulating at the same time, seemingly plausible um, photos of the events. Um, either these photos were completely fake or were taken out of context. They were taken from different days. And so what happens now, and we, by the way, saw this uh, during the last incident in Boston uh, during the bombings, is we have this flood of photographs and video surveillance coming in, and interject in there are all these sort of hoaxes and fake things. And all of a sudden, even if they're in the minority, you've got this problem. What's real? What's not? Are we making decisions based on this? And you have a very complex landscape unfolding when everybody is a journalist when everybody can post and the mainstream media is picking up on these photographs and reproducing these, you suddenly have this very fast and rapid dissemination of false information. So how we trust the types of images that are coming out on a day-by-day -day basis because everybody has a camera, everybody has internet access, and everybody suddenly is a photojournalist. So very complicated issues. It is not just the Twitters and the Facebooks, it is the mainstream media. 
So when bin Laden was uh, killed um, uh, not that long ago, uh, many newspapers ran this photo. I actually airbrushed, I've actually photoshopped this um, so, because this is sort of a gruesome fi picture of the bin Laden. But presumably it was meant to show that bin Laden was dead. It was a dead uh, picture of bin Laden. It had been completely doctored and it ran in major newspapers around the world. Um, and this isn't the first time this happens. This happens on a weekly, monthly basis that the New York Times, the AP, the Reuters, worldwide, we are publishing photos, either intentionally or unintentionally, that are just fake. And suddenly we have a problem of how we trust what we see in even the mainstream media. In our own backyard, we have a problem. You biologists that were yelling at me earlier, this is your problem. <laughs> I do some work for the Office of Research Integrity that investigates claims of scientific fraud. Um, and that is on a spectacular rise in scientific um, publications. For example, this is, a, I don't know what this thing is, a northern, western, eastern blot, something like that. Uh, this is actually what was submitted. This is the original. And you can see what they've done is they've just gone in here very quickly and removed that band. And as I'm told, these are the results. These scientific images dictate whether you got your results or not, whether you get published, whether you get a grant, whether you get tenure. And it is very easy to ma manipulate these images. And scientists are succumbing to the pressure of doing that. And we have a huge rise in the types of fraudulent images that are appearing in published scientific journals with real impact, by the way, um, let alone just the whole trust issue. Okay. On a national security front, we see issues of photo fraud. This was a photograph that was released by North Korea as they were um, um, seeking to intimidate their neighbors. It shows these hovercrafts. Um, um, in sort of landing and these military troops. If you look closely, something's a little wrong here. Uh, it turns out that this hovercraft is the same as, sorry, this hovercraft is the same as this hovercraft, which is the same as this hovercraft, and these three are the same. They're just cloned copies of each other. I'm pretty sure these are all computer generated or toy soldiers, although we're not positive about that. So here's a really interesting problem. There are parts of the world that we have very little access to, North Korea, Iran, elsewhere. And the way they give us information is through photographs. And suddenly, well, what's real, what's not? As a side note, by the way, I think it's hard to take a country seriously that can't figure out how to use Photoshop. But <laughs> sort of an aside. <laughs> so on the national security level, we have problems with photo authentication. Um, I've been talking about images, but it is not exclusively with images. So let me just play this little video clip. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> now, he is definitely the coolest president we've ever had, so that could be real. <laughs> But it is not. And that is impressive, by the way. I mean, it's one thing to alter an image, but to alter an entire body doing a completely different act. Now we are living in an age where this type of video can actually be done. And it can be done by, with due respect, students. It doesn't take Hollywood producers and film studios to do this kind of thing. The technology exists to actually make this kind of fairly sophisticated, albeit short, fake video. And suddenly, the landscape of everything has shifted. Right? What do we believe? What do we not believe? And in general, <laughs> if you learn nothing else from this talk, here's something you should learn. Any image with a shark in it is fake. <laughs> <laughs> My contribution to the field of forensics. <laughs> In general, we're having a harder, harder time believing what we see, whether it's in images, whether it's in videos, whether it's in audio, whether it's in scanned documents. And what we have been doing in my lab for the last 14, 15 years is trying to develop technologies that can authenticate images, videos, audios, and documents. I'm going to focus particularly on images. Let me just tell you what the philosophy of how we approach this problem is. Um, so one way you could approach the problem is to say, I have a trusted device, a camera. And that camera does some type of encryption where it grabs the pixels that are recorded in hardware. It does a secure hash, some type of encryption. It stores that, that, that technology. And then that follows, that hash or that signature follows the image, and then you can verify. So two problems with that technology. First of all, you need to have all those cameras doing that thing. And of course, we have billions and billions of cell phones out there with cameras that don't have the technology. And number two is you're extremely vulnerable to being hacked. And in fact, Canon and Nikon tried to do this a few years ago. And then within about a week, it got hacked. Act, which means the whole technology becomes useless. Okay? So there may be a solution somewhere and down the line, but we don't have it now because of the ubiquity of digital cameras, cell phones, and because of the vulnerability of that type of technology. So we take a slightly different approach. What we say 
is, first of all, we don't know anything about the images. We get images, we get videos, we have no control over the source, we download them off YouTube, somebody hands them to us, so we know nothing about the original processing, we have no type of watermark or signature. And what we ask is the following. What type of statistical, geometric, physical property of an image might have been disrupted as you were altering it? So that is to say, we think about the entire imaging process. We think about things in the world, how light interacts with objects, how light bounces off of things, how reflections work, how shadows work. We think about how that light is collected by a lens, how that light is focused, how it bounces around inside of the optical train, how it hits an electronic sensor, how it is digitized, how it is um, stored as a JPEG, compressed, and then read out. And that entire process, that entire imaging process has really interesting things going on. From the physical world, to the optical process, to the A to D converter, to the actual compression. And we sort of poke into there at every step and say, well, if somebody does this to an image, what, is it, what does it change down that, along that process, and can we reliably quantify and detect that? And so what I'm going to do is give you a broad overview of some of these techniques and each sort of part of that imaging process that I described um, to give you a flavor of some of the things that we're capable of doing. So let's start with the first one. So for better or worse, JPEG images are with us to stay. They are the absolute universe, universal standard. Um, all digital cameras now, um, all cell phones, uh, capture directly in JPEG. And what you need to know about JPEG is that it is what is called a lossy compression scheme. It throws away some information to save uh, memory on your uh, cell phone, camera, computer. So lossy compression schemes are good because it means that the transmission of and storage of images is much lighter, but it's bad because you've lost some information. It seems from a forensic setting losing information is never a good idea, but it turns out that the way JPEG throws away information is very interesting. So let me at a very high level just remind you or ex explain to you how JPEG works. So. You take an image, which is, of course, just a bunch of pixels. And for now, I'm going to assume I have a grayscale image. We can, of course, do this in color, but it's just sort of a minor tweak on this basic idea. So I have uh, a bunch of pixels. And let's say this is an 8-bit grayscale image. So that means the values go between 0 and 255. And so I have a bunch of values. And I'm showing you here just a single 8x8 eight eight block of a grayscale image with some pixel values underneath it. So the first thing JPEG does is it carves your image up into these little 8x8 eight eight blocks. And it does that for a very particular reason, because it's going to, in, just in that little block, it's going to throw away some information. It's going to move on. And if you've ever zoomed in on a JPEG image, by the way, you'll see those blocking artifacts. And this is why, because the first step does this. OK. So second step, I'm in an engineering school, so I can say this. It's a discrete cosine transform. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's a version of a Fourier transform. And if you don't know what that is, it turns out it doesn't matter. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these pixels. Well, it does matter. You should know what a Fourier transform is. But for the purposes of this, uh, we're going to take these values, and we're going to convert them according to this transformation here. That's just an 8-tab uh, DCT. And it seems like we've done something really, really dumb. We've gone from unsigned 8-bit integers, so just 8 bits to, to the values, to signed floating point values. So from the point of view of compression, we seem to have gone backwards. Now I have to represent floating point numbers, and they're signed, for God's sake. So how is this helping me? Well, the reason it helps me is because these DCT coefficients embody the spatial frequency content in the little 8x8 block. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw away information in the highest frequencies, the kind of stuff that the visual system doesn't really care about, and I'm going to preserve it in the lowest frequencies, which are over here, the DC and the first few harmonics. And the way we do that is we take the DCT coefficients, and here it is right here. We divide by an integer value, which depends on where you are in the frequency space, and then you round. So I'm going to divide by an integer, and I'm going to round. So, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, the, 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 these values down here, I'm going, to, I'm going to divide by a bigger and bigger number, because I don't really care about them. And you can see what happens is I've now got a lot of zeros in here. And zeros are really good for compression because we can use either Huffman coding or run length encoding to compress them. So the way we compress is uh, pixels, DCT, just a transformation that decomposes the images from pixels to spatial frequency. You quantize, you throw away small values that are not perceptually important, and then you do some kind of run length Huffman coding, entropy encoding that very efficiently encodes those zeros. Okay? So, all of that to say there's something very cool about the way you pick the quantization. 
So you would think that JPEG is a universal standard. It's, it's got a standards body. There is a document that describes what you do. And you would think they would sort of give you some guideline as to, well, how much should you throw away in the low frequencies, the mid frequencies, and the high frequencies? But they don't. They don't tell you. And that means you have to decide. So the engineer at Canon, the engineer at Nikon, at Olympus, at Sony, at, Photo, at Adobe, at Pixelmator, at Google, they make their own decisions. And it turns out they're all over the place. They, there's no consensus as to the right way to do this. They pick different values, and wildly different values. And by the way, there's 64 of them, and for a, for a color image, there's 64 by 3. So there's like 192 values. And there's some constraints on them. You want small values here, big values here, but it turns out the guys at Canon, when, for example, they have a really high-end camera, they pick really small values everywhere. But the guys at Apple, who don't care about the quality of their images, they use really big values because it's a cell phone, it's crappy optics anyway, so who cares if we compress the image to oblivion? Okay, so here's the cool thing. Uh, here is a quantization table. That's the, what you, you divide all the, the DCT values by for a Canon EOS Rebel, a Nikon D40, and Photoshop CS6. And first of all, you can just see the values are completely different. What you do see is a pattern. These values are small, small, small. These values are bigger, bigger, bigger. These correspond to the low frequencies, the things that the visual system cares a lot about. These correspond to the high frequencies. And you can see, at least for these three things, there's no overlap. So here's a really simple forensic technique. Figure out, oh, and these are, for most cameras, deterministic. Right? So your camera, for example, if you take an image with the same quality setting, it will always produce the same quantization table. Now, you often have several settings. For example, you have things like fine, medium, and you know, crappy. Right? And crappy lets you store like 10,000 images on your camera. Fine lets you store two images. Right? But those are discrete values of these quantization tables. There's a few cameras that do things dynamically, and let's not worry about those. So here's a really simple um, forensic technique. Go out and figure out what are the quantization vet tables used by every camera in every setting ever made. OK, so that's a hard problem. But let's imagine you can. And now I give you an image. And one thing you need to know is that inside of the image metadata, this is a little bit of data that sort of comes along with the image, is always the make and the model of the camera. It's always in there. Every camera does this. It's called the EXIF standard. So what I can do is I can go into my database and say, oh, this was taken from a Nikon D40. Have I seen this quantization table before? Nope. Never. Uh, but it's got this quantization table, and I've seen that before. That's Photoshop. So by simply looking at the packaging, how the JPEG was packaged, you can determine if it is an original coming off of a camera. Now, you can't tell what has been changed, but we can tell something has been changed. In certain places, that's a very useful place in a court of law. You're introducing evidence into a court of law. Stakes are very high at a national security level. Did this thing come directly off the camera? In fact, the AP and Reuters now require that citizen journalists don't use, um, what's that stupid filter people use? Instagram, yes. No Instagram at the AP, right? It's got to be a camera original. This is the only way they have to put a very, very high bar that you have to jump over so they can prove authenticity. So here's the question. What, is the, 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 what are the other things we can sort of g c gather up that, that embody the way a JPEG is sort of packaged. So there's a bunch of things, it turns out. So first of all, there's the size of the image. That actually varies across cameras because the sensors are different. There's the quantization that I just told you about. And I won't go into this, but part of the run length encoding, you have to make some design decisions about how you do that final entropy or run length or Huffman encoding. Now here's the really cool part. Uh, stored in every image is a, little, is a little thumbnail. That thumbnail is used for previewing the image when you're on the phone or on an operating system. It's stored as a JPEG, and amazingly enough, it uses a completely different set of quantization and Huffman codes. And, of course, has its own size. So suddenly, notice, by the way, that I'm not looking at pixel values. I'm looking at the packaging of how a JPEG was constructed. There's all these decisions you have to make in designing that, and these decisions have impacts and vary tremendously. And then there's a little bit of information about what I told you earlier, the EXIF data, how much metadata is stored in a camera. Some cameras store a ton of it, some store very little. All of them, fortunately, store the make and the model, which are right there, which now allows us to do a lookup. So here's the question. I'll tell you in a minute how we got all these images. We gathered, this is, this is an old slide now. This number is more like 50 million, and this is more like 4,000 cameras. But this distribution is about the same. So what I'm showing you here is a representation of how unique 
that all those JPEG parameters are that I just described for you. So this axis is equivalence class size. I'll define that in a minute. This axis is percent. So I define an equivalence class size of 1 if I find a JPEG signature, all of the parameters, the dimensions, the quantization, the Huffman code for the full resolution and the thumbnail on the XIF, if they are unique. If the only time we ever see that is from one camera make and model, you are an equivalence class of size 1. 70% of uh, the cameras that we see are unique. That's already sort of an amazing fact, right? 13% uh, of cameras are an equivalence class size of 2. That means there are two different cameras that share the same signature. In each case, every one of these, it's the Canon PowerShot SD-1000 and the Canon PowerShot SD-1000A. Almost always. It's two things that are basically the same release, just one after the other. 6% uh, have an equivalence class of size 3. Again, in every case, it is cameras of the same manufacturer with ever so slightly different models. So, for example, when Canon releases a power shot in this country, they release an, they release an Ixis in Asia or an Ixi in other countries. They, for us, they're different cameras, but they're, in fact, exactly the same. So a lot of this ambiguity just comes from renaming cameras for different names depending on where you distribute them. But in any case, what you can see is that there are very few cameras that don't have distinct signatures. So now, what we have been doing for the last almost 10 years now is getting lots and lots of images. Um, I mean, millions and millions and millions and millions of images from thousands and thousands of devices. It's a moving target because every month there's a new device coming out there. Um, I'll tell you that the majority of images that we've got, we, we have a 24-7 um, crawler that crawls uh, places like Flickr and other photo sharing websites. Um, those images are, we don't actually know a lot about, so we have sort of mechanisms for dealing with making sure we have tons of redundancy and other techniques for verifying originality. But the majority of images we now get are from crowdsourcing. Uh, we pay people our Mechanical Turk to send us their images from their devices. Um, and you can do it on pennies on the dollar, um, and you can get a tons and tons of data out there. It is an amazing resource for those of you who are trying to get stuff done online. It's, it's really impressive. Um, and so what we can do now, and we are very good at, is if I give you an image, um, I go into the metadata, I figure out what the make and model is, I go look at my database, I ask, is the signature represented um, the same as the, that what I, I extracted from the image? Yes. You almost certainly have an original. No. Well, either it's not in the database or something is wrong. And then we have ways of determining how good our coverage is for that camera and then assessing what the reliability is of that. Okay. So that was forensic technique number one. Now, notice that there are sort of two issues with that technique. One is, if something has been altered, I can't tell you what it is. Right? I don't know if you just put that thing into Photoshop and then resaved it accidentally or if you, you know, st stuck a shark in the image and then resaved it. There's no distinction between that. I just know the packaging is broken. Okay. That's number one, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. Number two is if I don't find the signature in my database, I don't know if it's something's wrong with it or if we just don't have coverage for that particular device. Maybe we didn't get all the different settings. I told you some cameras actually have dynamic settings. They actually change the, the quantization tables as on a per-image basis. Um, incredibly annoying for people like us, but this is what they do. And so sometimes we don't know. We don't know if it's an original. Okay, so the second technique deals with that latter problem, and then the other techniques will deal with the, the former problem. So here's something really cool about JPEG, is that it throws away information every time you compress it. And in fact, if you open up an image and put it as a JPEG, and you save it in Photoshop, and then you open it up again, and you save it again, and you open it up again, and you save it again, every time you do that save, even with the same settings, you're actually losing a little bit of information. You're actually degrading the image ever so slightly. And the reason is just floating point errors in the DCT and the inverse DCT transform and in the quantization and the rounding. There's, you just keep sort of chipping away at that. It, it saturates eventually. The image doesn't go crazy, but you are losing information. Now, let's think about that pipeline of altering an image. Image comes off of a camera as a JPEG. So it's been compressed. It's been quantized, Huffman coded, and it's sitting in there in that format. I now want to alter it. So I decompress it. I'm sitting in Photoshop, I've got my pixels. I do whatever I want to it, and then I recompress it okay, with a different quantization table, let's say, because I'm in Photoshop and Photoshop isn't shared by some other camera. So let's think about those three steps. So first step is, this is Q sub A is the quantization step. You take some DCT coefficient, you divide by A, and then you round. That was what I showed you on the earlier side. That's where you get the savings. 
How do I decompress? Well, this isn't quite right. I'm obviously not doing an inverse because I can't inverse the rounding. And the fl and, and, um, but what I'm doing is I have to get this guy back into its original scale. So I multiply by A. And then I recompress with a different value. Okay, that's B. Okay. So now what's happened is I've divided by A, I've rounded, I've multiplied by A, and then I'm going to divide by A and round. And that double compression with a different value does something really weird to the DCT coefficients. So let me just show you that. So we could spend you know, an hour going through all sort of the, the algebraic expression for us. I'm going to do this whole thing graphically because I think it sort of makes the point, um, although not quite as rigorous as proving what, how this actually happens, but I think you'll get the point. So imagine I've got a bunch of DCT coefficients. So this is what comes out of, I take the pixels, I do a DCT, and I've got these sort of floating point numbers. Okay? And then I round them, and I'm going to just look at a distribution of them. And for simplicity, let's just say that they, they vary between 0 and 10. They can only take on 10 possible values. Okay? And let's say that I'm going to compress those by dividing by 2 and then rounding. Well, if I take values in the range of 0 to 9 and I divide by 2 and round, that means they're now going to live between 0 and 4. That's obvious, right? So those are the only five discrete values I can now have. Well, let's decompress. Oh, sorry. So let's look at this. So what happens is these two values that were in this bin originally show up over here, because 0 over 2 and 1 over 2, when you round, go to 0. Uh, 2 over 2 and 3 over 2, when you, when, you, uh, when you round, go to 1, and so on and so forth. So what happens is you collapse. This, by the way, is the loss of information. I've taken all the values that are here, and I've collapsed them to here, and I can't go back. That's the loss of information. Okay. So let's decompress. How do I decompress? I push you back onto the original scale. So how do I do that? I multiply by 2. So this guy goes here, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, here, here. And of course, these stay empty because there's no values to be there. That's fine. That's, that's the loss of information. And now I'm going to recompress. I'm going to divide by a different number, though, 3, because I have a different quantization table. OK, so what happens here is these three values in purple end up here, because 0, 1, and 2 divided by 3, round, go here. 3, 4, 5, go here. 6, 7, 8, go here. And let's not worry about that. That's just a little edge artifact. OK, so here we are. These are my DCT coefficients. These are what I now have. And I'm going to ask the question, have these gone through a single compression or a multiple compression? Right? If they've gone through a single compression, then I know that that came off the camera. If it went from a multiple compression, then there's been some step in between when the camera first captured it. So how am I going to do that? Well, here's sort of a cool observation. Let's trace the values in here backwards. So this guy came from these three bins. This came from this. This came from this. And these two came from these four. So if you think about that entire process of compress, decompress, compress, these four bins, whatever was in there, dump into that bin right there. Okay? That seems clear. So now let's take a step forward. This guy came from these three, this one came from here, and these two bins dumped into here. Oh, that's sort of cool. So only two bins contributed to this guy. And then if we go over one more, three, two, four. Four bins contributed to that bin. And if I kept going, that pattern would keep going. So four bins dumped into here. Two bins dumped into here, four bins, two bins, four bins, two bins, just because of the rounding, the nature of rounding and even in odd numbers. So now we have a really interesting insight. Remember that this is going to be a histogram or a distribution of my coefficients. And whatever dumped into here has a nice representation, but this is underrepresented. And so what you know is going to happen is that the coefficients are going to look really weird. Every other bin is going to be underrepresented because not enough things poured into that. And in fact, these are DTC coefficients that were compressed once with a quality 3. These are ones that were compressed twice with a quality 2 followed by 3. And you get this really weird periodic artifact in the distribution of the DCT coefficients. And it's even worse. So this is, by the way, going from a high quality to a lower quality. The smaller the number, the lower the quality. It gets even worse if you go in the other direction. If you go from a... Um, uh, low quality to high quality, you get absolute zeros in the bins. Now, there's an assumption. My assumption is that the actual original DCTs have some reasonable smooth distribution to them, which it turns out it does. They're, they tend to be very Laplacian-like with some nice long tails. But when you see distributions like this, you now know something, that it's been doubly compressed. So in addition to being able to tell you this quantization, this, this packaging of a JPEG is not real, I can now actually go in and look at the bits and say, you know what? 
These things have gone through a multiple compression. And the cool thing is, I can do this for each of the 64 DCT frequencies. In fact, they're 64 times 3 because I have a color image. So I just have to find one of these things in which there's been an artifact introduced, and I know that something has changed from the time that the, the image was originally captured. Okay. This still has the problem, however, that I don't know what happened to the image. So as a general rule, where we are today in forensic science is we are very good at telling whether an image is an original. Did it come directly off of a camera? And that's because things like JPEG and other features um, introduce very specific um, correlations and artifacts and images, and manipulating those images really sort of hammer on those, and we can detect those, and we can quantify them, and we can use them to determine whether it's an original or not. So in certain circles, things like citizen journalists, courts of law, we've gotten very good at determining if things are original. Where things get more complicated is now when I start asking you, well, what has changed? So I give you an image, and it's not an original, and it's been doubly compressed, but that doesn't mean that something is wrong with the image. It can still be a reasonably truthful representation. It could be I just put it into Photoshop, white balanced it, cropped it, and then saved it. That probably is not going to fundamentally alter the interpretation of the, of the image. So how do you get at now the distinction between that and I fake the moon landing, right? or I put a shark into an image, or that's somebody's head onto somebody's body, or somebody was taken away from this image. Okay? Now you've got to get sort of start looking at the image and understanding what is happening inside the image. So let's talk a little bit about some of those techniques. So I've been doing this game of forensics for a long time, and there's a few things I can, I can predict. One is um, there are a lot of people who think the moon landing is faked, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald didn't ki kill JFK, that Elvis is alive, uh, that something about Tupac Shapur, the rapper, I, he's dead, he's alive, I'm not really sure, I don't read those emails, um, and that every time there is a major world event, there is an underlying government conspiracy that created it. Uh, the latest one is the Boston thing, the one before that was the shooting at the school, the one before that was 9-11, every time. And here's the other thing I know, all of those people have my email address. <laughs> So, I get a lot of emails from people claiming that if just I would use my energies for good, I'm going to crack this thing wide open. And they ask me to analyze things like the moon landing image and Lee Harvey Oswald photo and the 9-11 images. And the thing that they all do, which I really love, is they, they, they do their own forensic science. They find problems with the shadows and the lighting and all kinds of things. They're complete knuckleheads, by the way. Um, is this going on YouTube? <laughs> okay, we're going to want to edit that out. <laughs> um, uh, so one of the things that is ubiquitous in images is lighting and shadows. And of course lighting is ubiquitous because that's what cameras measure. They measure light. And so it turns out that lighting and shadows are really cool things to analyze. Uh, and there are some really nice ways that you can analyze lighting and shadows in an image. I'm going to describe just one of them to you. So here I'm walking around, you probably can't see this, but I can see my shadow. And I'm really obsessed with shadows these days because we've been sort of thinking about them for a long time. And certainly when you're outdoors, everywhere you go, I mean, assuming it's a reasonably sunny day, you see your shadow. And so let's just talk about shadows for a bit. So what is a shadow? Well, it's where the surface on, onto which the shadow is being cast, it's being blocked. Uh, the light is being blocked because of some object. In this case, my shadow is here. There's a light behind me. The light can't see the floor. Therefore, I'm casting a shadow. So let's imagine a very simple scenario here. You have two people standing outside, and what I want you to imagine is not this image that you're looking at, but literally, you're standing outside in the green, there's two people standing in front of you, and you can see their shadow being cast just to their left. Okay, so here we are in the world, two people standing there looking at you, you're chatting with them, and you can see a shadow. And let's think a little bit about the nature of these shadows. So here it is, their shadow, shadow. And I'm going to just look at a point right at the very tip there. Now, if I draw a line between that tip and the point on the shoulder, where the point on the shoulder is what is causing that shadow. So, of course, what, what's going on here is the light is coming in, and it's hitting you know, various things here. But right here, it's just grazing the shoulder. So if I draw a line between this point on the shadow, right up to there, and if I just keep going as far as I can go, I eventually have to hit the sun. And the reason I have to hit the sun is because that's the definition of a shadow. So when the sun can see the floor, it is light. When it can't see the floor, it's dark. 
So somewhere in there, between that little gap I just did, is the sun. So if we follow that ray all the way out, I'm going to intersect the sun. And that's true, by the way, whether it's a very, very distant light source like the sun, or whether it's a light source that's on the ceiling here. I could do the same game. I have my shadow, um, follow it up between the point on the shadow, my finger, and it has to intersect the light. So first of all, that's just sort of a cool, simple ob geometric observation. And let's look at this guy. Well, the same thing is true. And by the way, this is true regardless of what surfaces I'm casting on. So if I cast the surface onto, if I cast the shadow onto here and one onto the back wall there, all the shadows have to eventually hit the, the, the light. So I don't care the fact that they're all on the ground plane. So here we are in the world. We're imagining these virtual red lines that kind of point on the shadow to point on the object, follow all the way up, and now they're going to um, be um, intersect with the light up there. And of course, because the sun is so far away, those are parallel in our sort of version of this thing. But in reality, they, they bend ever so slightly because the sun is far, very, very far. Now, let's imagine taking a picture. So you pull out your iPhone, you take a picture. Okay. And let's say you sort of stepped off to the side and you're taking a picture at an angle. Okay, so you'd see something like this. So what happened to those parallel lines? Perspective projection. They start to converge. We know this. We know this because when we look at pictures like this, the railroad tracks, which had better be parallel to each other, the train's going to have a little bit of a hard time eventually, um, these converge to a vanishing point. Painters for hundreds of years have understood this, that if you draw things converging away from you to a vanishing point, that gives a perception of depth. That's the very nature of perspective projection. The people in the back of the room look much smaller on my retina than the people in the front of the room. They're further away from me. Okay? So what that means, if I can just go back one slide, is that in the image of these two people standing on the green with cast shadows, I can draw a line from a point on the shadow to a corresponding point on the object and follow it all the way up. And eventually, I'm going to hit a point which is the projection of the light in the image. It's where the light would have been imaged if I could have seen it. And that's going to be true over here, too. So suddenly, you have a very cool forensic technique. Take any image with cast shadows, find corresponding points on objects and shadows, which, by the way, you have to be very careful you have to make sure you've got the right points and that they actually match, follow them out, and they had better intersect at a common point if, of course, there's only one light source in the image. So let me give you an example of that. So here's a simple scene. Notice, first of all, that the light is not infinitely far away. There it is right there. And I've given you these little toys here. And you can see all kinds of shadows being cast by the various objects. And what I'm going to do, you can try this at home. Uh, draw a bunch of lines between shadows and points. So there's a shadow, there's a point, there's a shadow, there's a point, shadow, point. And draw them all out, and lo and behold, they intersect at where the light is projected into the image. So how is this helpful? Well, imagine something got digitally inserted into the image, and somebody painted the shadow in there, but it's a little wrong. So I'm going to just back up one. You can see that that shadow is a little wrong. It was taken with the light at a slightly different position. And you do this constraint now, and suddenly you find, oh, this guy's shadow actually intersects over here. These guy's shadows intersect over there. So here's what's really cool about this construction now that you know it. You, you, if you're like me, this is all I do now when I look at images. And like, t even on television, I do this. Um, I'm completely obsessed with this construction. Um, and by the way, here's a weird thing. Uh, people who write video games don't respect physics. Uh, sorry, that sounded a little <laughs> weirder than I expected. Um, what they do is they actually render scenes where there's multiple light sources, even though they don't have to. Um, the, the, the actual lighting in those, in those video games are all over the place. And I think they do it for aesthetic purposes because real shadows actually look really strange. And that leads to another really interesting experiment we did. We actually did a psychophysical experiment. We, had, we, we brought people in and we showed them images with shadows in them that either were consistent or inconsistent. And we asked them, are these real? Are these not real? Is there an inconsistency? And people are a chance. They have no idea. They have no idea. I mean, you could do, I mean, we could eventually tell them this, and they could draw the lines and do it. But just looking at the image, your intuition of what real shadows look like is incredibly bad. Um, and mine is too, by the way. <laughs> so the reason, by the way, I think, is because shadows are sort of a nuisance to the visual system. Like, if you think about the things we have to do, when I see a shadow, I shouldn't be like, whoa, what is that, right? I should just know, oh, it's a shadow, I'm going to ignore it. 
or if I'm reaching for something, I shouldn't have to worry about a shadow. Or if I'm trying to look at something that's in shadow or not in shadow, I shouldn't think that it has a different color. And there's good evidence that the brain largely dismisses shadows when it's processing its visual world. And if that's true, then there's no good reason why your brain should have evolved to be able to reason about the physics of shadows in uh, linearly perspective rendered images. And it turns out we haven't. And artists know this. They've been cheating shadows for hundreds of years in paintings. Uh, the Hollywood knows this, they can cheat shadows. Uh, video game producers know this, you can cheat shadows. The visual system doesn't care. As long as it's sort of black and soft and fuzzy, the brain is like, that's a shadow. Uh, and that's really interesting. Okay, one more. So, I've also gotten really obsessed with the reflections. As you can imagine, it's really hard for me to read magazines. I look at every image. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm drawing lines all over them. Um, so reflections are really cool. First of all, in man-made environments, they, they occur almost everywhere. Um, I see reflections on the back of the glass over there, on my computer screen, on any type of glass or mirrored or reflective surface, you will see reflections. On people's glasses, you see them. In your eye, I see them. Um, we have a whole other technique for peeling off reflections from people's eyes. It's re really very cool, and they're actually fairly more, they're more common than you expect. So in this case, for example, this cat, which I'm assuming is fake, um, has been, um, the reflection of it has been rendered in the building over here. And it's pretty easy to do that. You just take the cat, you, cat, you flip it around, you make it a little fuzzy, you blur it a little bit, and you plop it in there. And, and, and what you know is that if it wasn't in there, something would be wrong, because you can see the reflection of the other things in the scene, and if you didn't see the cat's reflection, well, something would seem a little odd, right? So when we create fake photographs, you actually have to be very careful about looking at all the reflective surfaces in the image, including the eyes, and making sure you put the right thing in the right place. So reflections have a very specific geometry, similar to shadows, in fact. So let's talk about that for a second. So here's a mirror, black vertical line. Here's an object, stand, here's a person standing um, into the mirror, and this is their reflection that they see. And what I've drawn is corresponding points between objects on the person and their reflection. Light, thank God, travels in a straight line. And so what that means when I look in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in the mirror, there, if, if, if the mirror is, is, is flat relative to me, then there will be a straight line that connects me to, sorry, this point on, my, on me to my reflection. And all these lines will be straight. I'm viewing this at a really weird angle, by the way. I could never actually do this. This is the mirrored surface. And I mean, so now let's imagine taking this thing and looking at it prospectively. So that is, I have a mirror here, I have a person standing, and I see the reflection. If in the world there are straight lines and parallel lines that connect a point on an object to a point on the reflection, then what do we know from what we just talked about? Those have to converge to a vanishing point. It's a different type of vanishing point. It's sort of a virtual vanishing point out here. It, doesn't, it actually has sort of a very cool geometric property with respect to the mirror, but it's not like the sun. It doesn't tell you where the sun is, but it does tell you something about reflections. It tells you that if you can find corresponding points on objects and the reflections, they have to intersect at a single point, assuming this is planar. Right? If it's not, then, of course, all, rules, all, all bets are off. So, for example, here's a little uh, toy scene. Uh, this is a mirrored surface, of course. Three dinosaurs out here. The reflections, I've drawn correspondences between points on the object and the reflections. You see them all, and they converge at a vanishing point. Okay. For those of you who know about vanishing points, this has a very cool property. So these, the, this edge and this edge will have a vanishing point somewhere out here. Uh, this edge and this edge will have a vanishing point up here. This is actually the, the third vanishing point that corresponds to an, an, um, an orientation that is orthogonal to both of those. Um, so it's almost like it's a cube. And that, if you have three vanishing points from three mutual orthogonal um, planes, you have real power in an image. You can actually infer all kinds of things about a camera. So there's things that beyond this that that vanishing point gets you that, are, that is not intuitive. Okay, so now if I create a fake by just moving that reflection a little bit, now you've got a problem. So now you have a construction for making sure that reflections are pasted in. We did, by the way, the same psychophysical experiment with reflections. People have no idea. You have no idea where the reflections are. In fact, uh, I used to live in Boston. I used to take the tea to work every day. And um, I got obsessed with reflections back then for a different reason. And what I would do is I, I would sit in the tea and I'd look, at a, I'd look in the, 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 the window and I'd see a reflection. Do this someday when you're on a bus or somewhere sort of crowded with the reflection. And just don't cheat. Try to figure out where the person is that you're seeing the reflection. It's really hard. 
Like you have to think, okay, here's the surface normal, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Okay, that angle is about 30 degrees. That's about 30 degrees. And then you can do it. But just your intuition is really screwed up when it comes to inferring about reflections. And I don't really understand why that is. But it means when we look at these images, we have no idea what's going on at sort of an intuitive level, which I think is sort of interesting. Oh, sorry, there's one other thing. In those psychophysical experiments, not only were we bad at it, we didn't know we were bad at it. So when we ask people to judge their certainty in their measurements, they were extremely certain. Certain. Um, the worst, by the way, were the professors. <laughs> they were really sure of really wrong answers. <laughs> and I won't name names. <laughs> okay. So um, we talked about sort of two ends of the imaging spectrum. Uh, JPEG, what happens at the very end of the imaging process. Um, when you finally take that digital image and you package it into a JPEG. And we talked about the other end, lighting and reflections. And in between, there's a whole host of things. Um, so for example, um, in the optical, there is lens distortion. Um, the fact that the lenses are not perfect lenses, so they bend lines a little bit. There are chromatic aberrations, uh, color splitting because of um, Snell's law. There is vignetting because of the aperture in an image. Um, at the digital end, when you're actually taking the signal and digitizing it, there is color filter array interpolation, the way you go from a single sensor to a three-channel color image. There are nonlinearities in the sensor, things like gamma com um, correction. And then we didn't talk about things that happen directly in the image, like you take a chunk of image and you resize it, or you paste something into an image, um, or you uh, clone the way the North Koreans did. Each one of these things leaves behind a very specific type of artifact in the image, they're all a little bit different. And so what that means is that as we are hunting for fakes, um, we can find even the smallest mistake that you made, whether it's in the physical world, in the optical terrain, in the digital part, or in the compression. And so the game is not we are going to make creating fakes hard. It means we are going to take it out of the hands of the amateurs. And we are going to raise the bar. We are going to make it really painstaking. We're going to make you work for it. And we're going to make it risky. We're going to make it so that if you don't get absolutely everything right, you have a chance of getting caught. It's the same way, by the way, that the Secret Service thinks about counterfeit money. Right? They know they don't stop counterfeiting, but they've made it really hard. Right? The knucklehead with an inkjet printer can't do it anymore. Right? So you need more money, more expertise, more time, more risk. That's the game that we're playing. And the good thing about that is we will forever be employed. Right? Because that's the game we're going to be playing for a long time to come. Thank you. This is, um, however, um, there's a little trick being played here. And this is the trick you will see when, when, when hunters do this. Notice how far back he's standing from the hog. That's actually perspective per, um, um, distortion. So what you do is you think, oh, he's standing next to the hog. Well, if he's this big, the hog must be this big. But he's actually pretty far back relative to the hog. And so it makes this guy look really big. He is still really big. I think it was like 800 pounds. But um, you can play this really cool perspective trick by just taking a few steps back. And then suddenly, the judgment you're making is not quite the right one. But as far as I know, it's a real photo. And by the way, so is this one, as far as I can tell, um, this, this huge um, fish. This one is real. Um, I should say. Um, we're pretty sure this one's real. Um, we actually did a really complete lighting analysis of this, and it's really, it's amazing. Everything is just absolutely perfect. We also did a full-blown 3D lighting shading analysis of Lee Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald photo, and all the things that people have pointed to, I'm sorry, YouTube, um, are just wrong. And in fact, that, that image, there is nothing physically implausible in that image. And it's really interesting to see where the mistakes were made perceptually about judging it. Yeah, you can, and so can I. Um, so a couple of things. So you're right that we put a little bit of value, a little bit of judgment here, in particular, um, these two things. Right. So a couple of things. Uh, so we should say that, oh, and by the way, I can fake the quantization tables too, and so can you probably, but not the average person. But the average person can probably do this because it's just stored as plain text. Right. So, but think about the context of that. So if you want to fake an image to make it an original, Right? You wouldn't make this be inconsistent with this stuff. You'd make it be consistent with this. 
OK, so let's assume that you can get that to be right. But then you also have to get all this right. And by the way, there's things in here I'm not telling you about. I'm holding stuff back. Uh, so go ahead and try. <laughs> we can play a little game. Uh, there's a few more things uh, that when people edit JPEGs, they always make a few mistakes, and we, we, we hold them back. And then there's the whole double compression stuff that we do, and so on and so forth. But you raise a good point that each of these techniques has a weakness to them. Every single one does. And they have countermeasures to it. But that means you have to get every single one right. And, and then know the things that we're not telling you. So not impossible, but hard. Yeah. Apart from the fact that you're becoming more sophisticated, is, is it becoming generally easier or generally harder um, yeah. to catch? Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's the, the same technology that makes it easier to create a fake is also making it easier for us to detect them, right? So here's what I've noticed is that really, well, first of all, the real answer is I don't know. Because the reality is we only know about the fakes that we find. We don't know about the fakes we don't find. So in reality, there may be really good people out there that we just don't know anything about. So, however, I think, I think the truth is the, two things. One is, I think things like Photoshop are allowing you to do more and more things automatically. So the latest thing in Photoshop CS6 was um, content-aware fill. You just highlight an entire region, hit delete, and it just fills it in magically. And it's really sophisticated and incredibly cool. So the field of computer graphics, computer vision, computational photography, image processing, are developing algorithms to do very sophisticated processing that you know, really makes the average person to be able to do sophisticated edits. However, all of those techniques have a certain underlying algorithmic um, component to that. And we can actually look at those and say, ah, this has been filled in because it solves a fourth order, partial, high order differential equation. Ah, we see a problem. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. And then there's a whole other weakness to all of these things, which is, for example, take, it, take an image, doctor it, print it on a high-quality printer, and rephotograph it. Well, we have a whole host of techniques that can actually detect that something has gone through that process. So you have to really come at this in different ways. But so, you know, whose job is getting easier? Um, I think in some ways our job has gotten easier because the bar was always so low, right? There was nothing for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. And so suddenly we can do some pretty sophisticated things. I think we have taken it out of the hands of the amateurs. But as in any of these races, there are people who are highly dedicated to you know, getting around it, and they will always be there. But I think that number is going to keep getting smaller. Is there any, like, watchdog website that's on the lookout for high-profile fake media? <laughs> the entire internet. <laughs> <laughs> Reddit. Go to Reddit. These guys are... I have a really... So, there, there's, so you raise a good point, though, which is that there is a, there's a lot of eyes on images, particularly high-profile images. And there is some question as to whether that's a good or a bad thing. So, for example, in Boston a few weeks ago, uh, there was an entire online community at Reddit that were pouring through thousands and thousands of images and videos looking for the bad guys and claimed to have found them multiple times, turning out to be completely innocent people and accusing them of being the bombers in Boston. That is terrifying. So I come back to the same thing I was talking about with these psychophysical experiments. Um, there are certain things the crowd are good at. Um, I tell you, we have a million images. We are looking for this very specific things. Give it to a million people, parallel processing, right? What the crowd is not good at is an actual investigation. But they don't know the difference between those two things, and I think it's dangerous. And I think it's, it's, it's OK if you're not good at something, but you have to know you're not good at it. And if you don't know, then that's where you're going to run into trouble. So I think a lot of these online communities, and I'm picking on Reddit because that's the most visible one, but all of them have a little bit of a problem that they don't really know where their boundaries are, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And I think that's important to know. But the fact is, is that every remarkable image that comes out has thousands of eyes on it, but there's this interesting backlash happening too, which is truly remarkable photographs nobody believes anymore. Right? Because there's all these people out going, oh, it's too good to be true. It must be fake. Oh, I, and I, I can tell because I've been doing this for a really long time. You can't tell. And so there's this really interesting sort of conflict. And I think what's nice about these techniques is that they're objective. Uh, and they're based on sound, mathematical, and physical principles. And, and their application, can, I think, can tell us something fairly definitive. Uh, that question just reminds me of whether these tools are being used in the reverse. So have, yeah. Yeah. Uh, corresponding yeah. Are the same tools available to take this process of detecting and yeah. If they're not, they will be soon. Right? So for example, with these shadows, once I tell you this, now you know what to do. 
Create a fake shadow and just make sure they're consistent. And you can imagine the same tool that allows me to analyze this can tell you, oh, uh, all these shadows, the light is here. For this object, it should be here. Go ahead and draw it. You can imagine a, photo, a plug-in photo, uh, for Photoshop for doing this. Um, so absolutely. Now, I will say that some of the forensic analysis that we do have easier countermeasures than other, like this one. But we have other ways of analyzing um, other types of shadows, attached shadows, and lighting, how the lighting um, sort of falls around um, the object that are much harder to fake. So some are easier to fake, some are harder to fake. But the thing is, you got to get them all. You can't just get that one. So yes, I think it's a matter of time between exactly what we do is simply turned around. But the, 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 the thing is that they're sort of codependent, too. Like if you start messing with the shadows by warping it, you're going to disrupt some underlying noise pattern. Well, if you fit the, fix the noise pattern, you're going to screw something up in the JPEG. And if you don't get, I mean, so there's this sort of ripple effect. And every time you start messing with it, it just gets more and more messy. And so that's our hope is that it's such a tangled web that people will just run away. Ah, yeah, so you're talking about steganography. Exactly. Right. So um, we used to do some work in steganography. We don't work anymore, so let me just tell people what that is. Um, so steganography is sort of a modern-day version of how you do covert communication. You take a digital image, a digital video, video a Microsoft Word document for that matter, and you surreptitiously hide some information. So the easiest thing in an image, take every pixel and just twiddle it by a very small amount. It'll be imperceptible to you, but to the person that receives the image, they can go into each pixel, extract the bits that you encoded the message in, and you've got a secret message. Uh, there have been rumors and suggestions that everything from organized crime to terrorist organizations use that. I think the evidence that they actually use it is pretty weak. Um, I don't know how much they use it. Um, so we, we've sort of, sort of backed off from that field. We've done a bunch of work in detecting those things. That field is, is alive and well. Um, the ability to detect hidden messages and things like digital images and digital video is actually quite rich. And if you want, I can give you some citations for it. But we sort of backed off from that. Yeah. It, well, when you crop it, it doesn't, but when you resave it, it does. Because after you crop it, you have to save it. Now, now, now you got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And the other thing is that I love that button that I press that brightens the picture. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my suggestion. You can go out and for like 20 bucks, in fact, they're probably in serial boxes now, get a one terabyte disk. Take your images, put them on that disk, and then go crazy with the enhance button. <laughs> Rob. So, honey, given that you know, I'm, I'm one of these conspiracy theorists, I know that there's, there's nothing that you can ever say that will persuade me because I'm a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. So, okay. That's fine in, in the world of conspiracy theorists, but presumably conspiracy theorists get on to juries and stuff as yeah. well. So when you go into the courtroom as a scientific witness, and I presume this extrapolates to all kinds of, of scientific witnesses, yeah. uh, to what extent does the jury of the peers actually, are they willing to accept yeah. the scientific analysis? Well, that's a good question. So I, I do do a lot of expert witness testimony. Um, and I think it's incredibly interesting, and I really enjoy it, and everything from criminal to civil to patent litigation. And I have to say, with few exceptions, I have been impressed with the jury system. I don't actually think it's perfect, but I have a lot of respect for the jurors. I think that they actually are trying their best. I don't think they always do, their, do the best, but I honestly think that they are trying, and trying to parse a very complex scientific landscape. I mean, these are 12 people who couldn't figure out how to get out of jury duty, right, who are now having to, <laughs> to assess. No, but, but that's our job, and I think actually that's why professors are actually, um, are, you know, people who spend their career teaching are the ones who be, should be the experts. Because our job is to inform, you know, a juror in the, the simplest possible and the most honest possible way, where is the technology today? 
right? What can we say today, whether that's DNA, fingerprinting, forensic science, ballistics, and help them come to a decision? I don't think we should be advocates for one side or the other. I, think, I actually think, by the way, as a sidebar, that experts in this country should be hired by the court, not by one side or the other. I think we should be impartial as possible. That's the way the Europeans do it, by the way. They have impartial um, um, experts. But I think it's really important, and for the most part, I think juries have done pretty well, um, even though it is very, very complex, and you have to go through some math, and they're all like, oh, my God, I should have paid attention in high school, right? So, but, but, but I, I've been impressed. I mean, they, almost always, I mean, almost every case I've worked on, I thought, you know, the jury made the right decision. And I think that's, that's a testament to the system, actually. We'll do one more and then we'll close. Yeah. Yeah. Many of the telltale markers you mentioned depend on the JPEG lost format, what Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the first few I did were sort of very specific to JPEG because that's sort of ubiquitous. Uh, the thing with RAW is that all the RAW formats are proprietary. So if you get an image in a RAW format, you're actually pretty sure that it's an original because they're all proprietary in nature. So it's, it's very hard to sort of reverse engineer Nikon's RAW format. Um, so, but we don't deal with, you know, so obviously the lighting and the reflection couldn't care less. It's a photograph. We don't care about what the underlying format is. But for the format specific, we've only looked at the lossy compression because those in particular lead to um, artifacts. But things like TIFF, PING, um, PN, um, um, BMP, and RAW, you know, we don't do anything. So we've sort of stayed away from those, but they're also pretty much in the minority. <laughs> you know, 